Well, we are so super, super lucky to have Matt Nelson with us today. Um, Matt Nelson is the executive director of Presente.org, which is the largest online Latinx organizing group in the United States, I think probably anywhere. Um, Matt Nelson is a Colombian born social activist and seasoned campaign, strategic, campaign strategist. He was also organizing director at Color of Change. Um, we actually heard from Rashad a few weeks ago, Matt which everybody knows Color of Change is the nation's large, largest online black civil rights organization. Matt was organizing director there for five years. Uh, Matt grew up in the Rashad Midwest. And Rashad and I share a birthday. <laughs> you and Rashad, really? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Both October 13th. Oh, happy uh, belated birthday. <laughs> yeah. You could not be more different. And the, M <laughs> and the MIA song is interesting because one of my birthdays I actually hung out with MIA like four or five years ago on my birthday. Ah, oh, so it's, it's MI's birthday too? All coming full circle. <laughs> no, no, she was just hanging. She had a con long story for another day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, well, besides hanging out with happen. MIA, Matt has been a lifelong advocate for social justice using technology, written media, and culture through many organizing groups he's worked with, including mine. We've been working together for many years. Um, he's worked with uh, and he's written several books uh, or contributed to several books, including Ferguson is America, Roots of the Rebellion, Welcome to the Revolution, Universalizing Resistance for Social Justice and Democracy in Perilous Times. Um, he is an excellent speaker, author, has a new book out that we assigned selections from called Turnout, uh, which is so timely and relevant to this class because, oh, there's the Ferguson book. Thank you, Matt. Can you show everybody the cover of the turnout book? Thank you. Um, Matt got, there are several people who have spoken in this class that are in the book that Matt put together, including me and Amy Allison and others. Um, but it's so relevant right now because besides being a book on overall turnout, how we need to do turnout differently, how we need to think about voter turnout differently, I think one of the most uh, things I'm happiest about Matt joining us today is that we actually haven't talked very much in this class so far about the rise in Latinx voter turnout and engagement this year. It's pretty dramatic, especially in states that could flip like Arizona and Texas in the near future. Um, and it's, it, it honestly is one of the biggest, I think it will be one of the biggest components, drivers of change over the next several years as the Latinx population grows faster than every other population. So thank you so much, Matt, for being with us today, for taking the time in a really, really, really busy time, crazy time. We really appreciate it. Right on. And thank you, everybody. And it's nice to, let me make sure I can see some of the class. Yeah, this is, this is great. And I really appreciate being here. Um, thank you, Saru. And yeah, and I'm, I guess part of why I'm really excited to be here is because of the students. And I really do believe we're in a time where we are all activists now and we really need each other. And um, it is going to be uh, social movements that will determine what happens in this election and beyond. Um, and, you know, it's, it's people who are in this room and who are in this class who, um, who make social movements possible. So I want to thank everybody specifically for that. Um, and yeah, we're at just a, a new incredible time. Um, just quickly, you know, I was born in Colombia and grew up in Minnesota, which makes me a proud Minolumbian. And I helped launch Presente uh, nearly 11 years ago. And I've been the ED for the past four years. Um, and we do believe in and value uh, different forms of organizing. So we believe in building power through organizing. We believe in uh, changing culture through working directly with culture workers and artists and writers and also knowing that um, culture is an important form of power as our co-founder 
Faviana Rodriguez says often, culture is power. Um, and we believe in, uh, in staying presente um, and being present and relevant to what's going on in the world. Um, yeah, and, and since I mentioned one co-founder, I should mention the other co-founder, Roberto Lovato, um, who is a poet who just also released a really powerful memoir about um, El Salvador and about um, the uh, understanding you know, his own personal history, but as well as a political history through the struggle and the, um, through the civil war in El Salvador. So that's sort of where some of our roots come from. Um, we are also uh, uh, right in the wake of the epic 1500 mile uh, dreamer, uh, trail of dreams walk from Florida to Washington DC. Um, and that was where Presente really got our start and our grounding in, in some of that work. Um, and then recently, uh, we co-led a, a pretty substantial effort to um, defund and abolish the private prison industry. And to date, we've gotten eight banks to pull more than $2.3 billion of funding from the industry. And we're, we feel close. We feel close that we can um, that we can make the profit incentive for torturing our communities and families um, end it. Uh, so that's something that that's really important to us uh, that we're working on. And um, you know, today's topic around um, this is like we're 13 days, right? For 13 days before the election, and it's just an incredible time. Um, so I do. I don't know how how it works, Saru, but I actually really encourage people to get in the chat and, um, you know, from anything. I'll take song recommendations that are getting you through, albums you've listened to, like what's been inspiring you, what kind of um, movement stuff you've been into. Um, you know, I recently listened to the whole Bob Marley and the Wailers Exodus album, and that like really helps me um, stay focused, uh, you know, keep the apartment clean as well. So yeah, I'll take that from like, yeah, just what you're thinking questions. I think I'd like this to be as active and interactive as possible. Um, and part of this is that a lot of this is um, just forming. Um, like we're going to talk about elections, we're going to talk about some of the data, but the data is evolving every day. And the best data is actively being pulled from the different voter files and the different um, real-time surveys that are happening. So um, a theme is to give like some best thinking that we have so far and to talk about some of the background and histories from the book. But, you know, I, I can't understate the fact that um, this is a time where we need everybody and we need us together, you know, politics has to be uh, mutual aid now more than ever. Um, and regardless of what happens on November 3rd, uh, we're all changed. You know, we, I think that, I don't know if, if you feel this, but I, I really, I don't know anyone who hasn't been dramatically changed in the last year. Um, and I think it's, it is a time to really um, understand how we get together to solve problems together and to, to reconnect in a way that, um, you know, that keeps us whole, quite frankly. And I do believe that the role and responsibility of human rights organizations like mine and on social movements is to um, reflect and to build up and to um, defend and protect our full humanity. And that's something that we can't ignore right now because so much of that is in is in peril. Um, so, for these last few minutes, or for these last next minutes, um, what I'll lay out is some of the core theories around the book, um, which was an anthology and labor of love. And people can find a lot of the details I'm talking about um, 
at emergencyelection.org, which is a book website, but it also provides some of the best tools from Vote America for people to make their voting plan to, um, uh, you know, get your ballots and whatnot. I am going to be filling mine out this week. Um, and also um, to participate. And so, and I'll be dropping other links in the chat for people to peruse as we go through some data. Um, but the whole, when we are conceiving of this book, um, myself and the co-editor, Sarin Mudliar and Charles Derber, um, you know, we wanted to bring together an incredible group of, of people working on elections, but also working on elections through the perspective of social movements. And so, yes, there are some like elected officials in this book, but you won't see a lot of pundits or campaign managers, or it's people who come from social movement work who believe in the importance of shaping and participating in elections as a way to um, have, a mo have a democracy movement, quite frankly. And so when we were putting this together, we, we thought about this concept of, okay, this is an emergency election in an emergency. And when we say emergency election, we mean that um, something that can dramatically shape whatever existential threats are facing society. And, um, and some emergency elections we sort of know about, like um, uh, the emergency election of, of FDR that you know, precipitated the, the New Deal and a different sh uh, shift in society. We talk about the election of Abraham Lincoln, which shaped how, the, um, you know, how slavery was addressed in the country. And, um, so there's been a handful of other emergency elections. And when we thought about this, we actually thought 2016 was also an emergency election that shaped the course of politics and society, but we actually didn't understand it to be an emergency election until it was over. So we wanted to then provide that context of how do we then best prepare and address and how do social movements and activists address an emergency election in an emergency. Um, and then the other part was to um, bring together a lot of people who can talk about well, what's really going on with voters, what really matters to voters, what turns people out to the polls, and what builds power beyond the polls. So that was the that's the goal of that's the goal of the book was to provide a real world resource and also to build a, a powerful community that can continue the work and that's what we've been able to do through the different contributors is now it's it's a hub it's a resource for people um, that I think is going to become more and more important as we discuss what's going to happen on election day, what's going to happen the day after election day, what's going to happen between election day and inauguration, and then what's going to happen moving forward. Um, so, yeah, and we fundamentally believe that, like, the power of social movements are good for democracy, and that, um, you know, this election will shape, you know, what we face in terms of existential crises, like climate change, like pandemics, like um, how we reconcile with white supremacy and racism in the country, how we understand the economic crisis that is, that is increasing. And, um, you know, all that aside, I think that, um, that it's also very personal um, because we're going to have to learn how to regather with each other as humans in a society. And we're also going to have to learn and figure out how we address and heal from the dramatic psychological impact that um, an economic crisis and a pandemic and um, you know all the other um, 
instability that we face. And I think that there is a lot of um, um, individual pain that we're going to have to heal in addition to, to connecting it to um, how we heal as a society. And so I think that there's, that there's, um, that there's a lot there that we wanted to tackle, which is why we did a book um, so that we could go more deeply into the work and not just be in a point where a lot of activists are as like constantly this rapid response mode, um, you know, trying to react to whatever the latest crisis was. You know, I, I do believe that it's important for um, activists and organizers to be able to take the time to reflect, to build with community, to develop theory, to um, test it out, to just the act of writing and the power of crafting the word and editing it with um, peers and people you care about and advancing um, rigorously how we're thinking about things I think is really important, you know, so there was like a spirit of um, doing a book with the spirit of like a, a warrior poet, you know, wanting to wanting to really um, build a community that can help. And um, so we're really appreciative to the contributors. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's the book. And again, always open to feedback. This is a, um, this is an ongoing process. So what I wanted to move to now is um, just getting into a bit about this election. Um, what we think is going to happen, what we know, um, and what we might know uh, during the election. So is that fine? Can I move on? OK. Um, and I'll try to drop. Let me actually just drop a handful of, of great resources, mostly on election day and beyond, but just so you're prepared. So these are a couple of sites that'll be most active for election day. Um, and let's talk about that. So let's talk about um, what we know already. And so what we know already is that Biden is going to win the national popular vote. Like that's highly likely that that's going to happen. We also know that Biden will likely be behind on election night just because of how the, um, how the count is going to be counted just because of how ballots are going to be counted. And it's likely that um, that uh, key states, um, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin in particular, but some would include Florida and Arizona in these key states, are going to be um, flashpoints of contested election conflict. Um, Florida is going to be really key because Florida actually reports very early. And so it could be a situation where if Trump wins Florida and then seems ahead in the polls because, you know, the, the more red states are, are, may, are likely going to report early, he could say, look, I'm ahead. It's midnight, East Coast time. I won, I won, I won. So um, when really like he could, he could declare that victory when there are, and, and the press will say that, you know, there's no way that you can declare it because it's not ready yet. So that, that is part of what we know already is that, um, uh, and it's gonna take a while to actually get the, the, the results unless it's a total landslide one way or another but if it's a landslide, we're actually going to know that. If it's going to be a landslide, we're going to know that on election day um, or before. But um, and in, and so um, 
what we'll know before election day is um, we'll know whether or not it'll be a landslide or it'll be too close to call. And so I, I think that now there's this debate of is it going to be a total landslide or too close to call? And I think we'll know we'll be more clear on that as the days as the days move forward. Um, I think likely it's going to be um, uh, it's going to be close in a handful of key states. I think that there'll be multiple states that'll just be contested, and hopefully they'll be contested in a way that um, nobody gets hurt. But I I think that it's possible that it'll be contested in a way that um, that can escalate violently. Um, I see like, uh, uh, and again, the states that I think could be contested potentially violently are uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida. Um, and I think, uh, but nationally, we'll sort of understand more of the lay of the land in terms of how close it's gonna be, you know, right before election. In the battleground states, um, before election day, um, we'll, we'll kind of know mostly the state shakeout. Um, I think that's, again, like, like this data is coming, this data analysis is coming in every day. So we'll know, um, we'll have an idea of what minimum threshold each candidate has to get in order to win on election day. So we'll have an idea based on incredible early voting. I think, what is it now like? 30 million ballots have already been submitted in early voting. It's just a, a phenomenal, of what, 400%. So there's a phenomenal number there, which is actually a, um, the early vote tally is um, very different and very exciting. And we'll get to that um, in a little bit. Um, let me actually share with you, now that I'm talking about data, let me share you on some of the recent, a site from some of the recent data. I, I do think Pew is doing a good job um, overall with, with the data tracking. So some things that I think that we should look for. Um, one is uh, voter registration. And so part of the key factor is like whose base is being mobilized right now. And, um, and in what states. So in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, actually um, Trump's base looks pretty energized. And so um, uh, evangelicals, um, non-college educated white folks over 30, are actually having um, some of the highest registration rates compared to those states' populations. Um, and that's in comparison to those three states with people of color who actually like the amount of people in the state versus how many are registered is actually a, a swings the other way. So um, that's one thing to to look at and um, actually COVID has had a pretty substantial impact in terms of registration, Democrat registration. Democrat early voting, while high, but new Democrat registration is actually um, lower in these states and others since COVID. Um, and that impacts uh, voters of color and young voters. Um, so far, I mean, we'll see if that switches the last in the, in the um, next two weeks, but that's actually a um, warning sign for the Biden camp. Um, and, and it also speaks to, and I don't know if, sorry if we're gonna talk about this more, but it also speaks to the ground game difference, like Trump's ground game has been 
going forward because you know they have the um, super spreader strategy um, and the like don't give a fuck strategy in a lot of ways pardon my language but like you know that's that's sort of I, I'm sure that's in the campaign plan somewhere um, whereas it hasn't been for the other side um, the other uh, interesting sign to look at, and you know, this is for for folks if you want to study this more. You know, one sign is like voter registration gaps as as you know percentage of a population in the state, and then how many are registered based on demographic. That data people can find if you want to nerd out on this. A lot of this data is from the Catalyst voter file. And sources like Pew and others grab the voter file and just crunch the numbers and do their own an analysis. But if you actually want to go deep into some of the raw data and, and you know, try to access the Catalyst voter file, like if you got skills like that, that's awesome. Um, I do not. Um, but another thing to look at is early vote. And um, Early vote as of last week um, has been pretty high for um, for black folks, um, for um, white college folks, and also fairly high for um, um, Latinx overall. However, they've been higher even for um, um, white non-college folks and rural folks, which lean more Trump. And so the early vote numbers um, skew Trump, but that's like, but not as much as they do in other elections because early voting was mostly dominated by Republicans until this election. Um, and so that's going to be really interesting how that plays out. Um, and then, you know, specifically, uh, we talk a lot about the Latinx vote and, um, you know, almost a million Latinx people in this country become 18 each year we're approaching 60 million strong in the country, 20%. Uh, and so there is like power numbers, but it's always been this question about um, how much do demographics shape destiny? It's another way of like saying Rashad's line of presence versus power. Um, but this debate around demographics uh, equating to destiny has been super complicated, uh, especially in Latinx communities. And I say Latinx communities because, you know, we're by no means a monolithic group, you know, even, and that even embodies the like complexity of the term Latinx. Um, but who am I to talk about the complexity of Latinx identity? I'm just a Minolumbian named Matt Nelson. You know, what do I know about that? Um, but it is, uh, and some of the best resource to look at the Latinx communities is Latino Decisions, which is a great, um, which is a great uh, research outfit. And, um, yeah, one of the things that they looked at is familiarity of the vote by mail, um, which is low in a lot of Latinx communities because, you know, many, like we learned to vote from family members and um, family members who come from, you know, home countries, there isn't really um, vote by mail. Like it's not a thing. Like for instance, in Puerto Rico, um, like voting is essentially like more of a community party, block party, you know, there's usually like a, a, a festive element to it. I think if you've been tracking some of the 
recent election in Bolivia, similar. Like there's, it's, it's wrapped in the culture. And so then when folks vote here, it's just a different, different, con different cultural context. And it's quite frankly, not as fun, but that's part of what I think organizers need to do is if we can make voting as fun as it is in uh, Cuba or Bolivia or Puerto Rico, like it'd be a wrap, you know, like Latinx turnout would be off the charts. And so one thing is um, Latinos in states with very high Latinx populations aren't too familiar with the process um, to vote by mail. And so that's a gap that, that you know, we're trying to work through, um, you know, with the book and other things um, and other ways to like, if this becomes a new norm, actually our communities have to be, you know, have to be part of this. Um, Latinx communities are still seen as like, uh, a contested group of people in terms of party affiliation um, because like of Latinx folks registered to vote, um, it's about roughly 40% Democrat, 25% Republican, and then a substantial amount, more than 30% have no party affiliation. And, uh, you know, Cubans remain the highest percentage electorate of Latinx people followed closely behind uh, Puerto Ricans. Um, and I think Arizona and specifically, like the best data we have um, shows that Latinx people comprise about 25% of registered voters in Arizona. Um, in 2018, up from 21% in 2016. And so Arizona is like definitely a, a place where uh, Arizona, Texas, California, of course, is a place where that really matters. Um, and in Arizona, um, around half of Latinx voters are Democrats, 20% are Republicans, and 30% are independent. Yeah, and then a very, again, like I mentioned, a very, very young voting, voting population. And so what that says to me is that part of if, if we're invested in Latinx communities early, then that's like, you know, you get like a voter for life. And I don't know what your, um, you know, I'd be really interested in hearing about people's first voting experience, like what got you to vote. Um, but for a lot of um, it's really interesting in Latinx communities because for a lot of it is like a, a woman head of household that usually shapes who votes and how people vote. But the Bernie phenomenon was really interesting for younger Latinx voters in that it also switched. Like it was younger people in the household then pushing other family members to vote, to engage, how to vote. And so this concept of familism in Latinx communities is a big one as it relates to civic engagement and participation, which makes sense because like culture is power and, and you know, part of, of the culture of, of civic activism is what, what you're doing in the family. But oftentimes, for voting, it's sort of the older generation that then shapes younger generation. Um, but we saw interesting trends here in the primaries, in the 2020 primary, where it's actually for Latinx communities, it was younger Latinx shaping what their parents and grandparents did, which actually wasn't the same in the Black community. Like younger Black folks didn't necessarily vote the same way as older black folks. And that was something that um, we'll see how it plays out in the general election. Um, so that's uh, a lot of the data that I had. Let me see if there's any like other good resources I wanna share with you. Yeah, definitely like we rely a lot on, on Latino decisions, 
Um, and I'll drop a Latino Decisions link in here. Um, and Pew Research. Uh, I do think the AFL-CIO is doing a great job tracking the election. And like, there's a handful of election super nerds that are all over this. Um, one of the contributors of the book, Deborah Cleaver, is a from um, Vote America, is a great election super nerd who's doing really good stuff. Um, and of course, like, you know, I could just list a bunch of people from the book. Uh, I'm glad Amy Allison came to your class. Amy Allison is a fellow Oakland friend. Um, but yeah, I would definitely, like part of the book resources, just perusing the contributors. And like, they all, I think we linked everybody's website on emergencyelection.org, but they're all doing great work. I mean, even Noam Chomsky wants to throw down for this election, um, you know, which is great because, you know, it's Noam Chomsky. Um, and then there's some, I guess, yeah, I should highlight a handful of other people. I think on the local level, uh, Helen Gim, a council person in Philadelphia, is doing incredible movement work around education. And so tying um, education into voter turnout and, and understanding that it's power building. Um, Cliff Albright and Latasha Brown have these amazing Black Voters Matter buses going around and, and it's like a party everywhere they go. And it's, they've been doing excellent job just with um, navigating COVID to do incredible relational voting. Um, and they, yeah, it's been really uh, joyful to see how they're mobilizing people in the South. Um, of course, Voto Latino is a, is a stalwart of voter engagement and we're participating in a, a border wall concert um, with uh, Las Cafeteras and Elo Black and a number of people who will be at the um, border having a big Rock the Vote concert this Friday. Um, and yeah, I think, but like I said, like we're all, we're all activists now and, um, and we all have to figure this out together. So before we move into the um, the like dialogue period with your professor, um, Dr. J, as I refer to her sometimes when we're in professorial situations. Um, before we talk with Dr. J, um, yeah, I think that, that, you know, I just want to help out as much as I can, you know, because as you know, students have always been the backbone of any social movement in recent history that we know of. And that's a, a big deal. And I do think that um, out of all the hardship that we've endured in 2020, every day I'm inspired by what's happening with the uprisings and with um, the leadership of students and younger people in every issue we work on and also how intersectional the issues are. And I think that what I've seen now with, with recent organizing is how much care and dignity that, that folks like you take into uh, social movement building and social movement activism. So I just wanna give a lot of gratitude to everybody in the room, um, knowing that like, you know, we're, we're gonna show up with as much solidarity and, um, and love as we can, uh, knowing that we're, we're, we're also learning all this with you. So yeah, thank you all. I can, we can move on to the next phase. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, I want to, before we talk about, I, I want to get into Presente and your work because you guys are engaged in some really great campaigns right now. But before we do that, can we talk a little bit more about Arizona and Texas? Because obviously Arizona is a state that is at play in this election in a way that it hasn't been in a long time. That's largely due to Latinx voter engagement and organizing on the ground. You just finished a book on Latinx political engagement, voter engagement, apart from turnout. 
Can you share any of kind of the big lessons or findings or key things that you wanted to say in that book around what it's going to take to really turn to to really engage Latinx voters and people at scale and then to turn states like Arizona and Texas. Yeah, and and I would include like there's states like Nevada that are like the next um, Arizona in terms of mass mobilization. Um, you know, I'll put another link in another effort we're doing on the C4 side because I think it relates to what you're saying is, um, and these are billboards that we're putting up with artists. And um, so it's, it's more, uh, and, it's, and it's rooted in local artists in different cities. And then billboards are going up and then we're like having a conversation around there. But I think that's part of it. Like, um, yes, the, the numbers are happening. There is more investment in the organizing infrastructure. But I think there's a thing that we say in, in Latinx communities that you got to have the conversation. So whenever you go to a place where, where there's lots of Latinx people or you even go to like, you know, the cookout or the event, like it's, it's typical for everybody to greet everybody. And I think that's like, in the, unless you have the conversation with the like frontline organizers, you're not going to get access or trust. And I do think that at this point, all organizing and voter engagement and voter turnout will move at the speed of trust. And so I think that that was disrupted. Like there was finally recognition around integrated voter turnout programs and relational organizing as it relates to um, voter turnout. There was finally a recognition of you, you, you just can't buy elections um, or you shouldn't be able to just buy elections um, and that you can't just um, be transactional with, you can't just either ignore communities of color entirely or be just totally transactional with them. And I think hopefully in 2020, we'll learn that, um, you know, investing in, in the deeper organizing not, not even talking about high, high propensity or low propensity voters, but talking about high potential voters. Um, and I think that there's a way to uh, uh, be real with people and have the conversation. And I think that we'll learn a lot this election cycle about what works. Like people are writing hundreds of thousands of postcards or writing handwritten letters to voters or having deeper phone calls with voters. But I think we have to connect to both, you know, the heart and the mind. The other thing that I think is really important that I would love to explore more is um, anger is motivating for people. Fear is demotivating for people. And anger and fear are like two sides of the same coin. And often like, you know, fear or hurt or sorrow are behind anger or vice versa. But in a time, in such an extreme emergency time where people are feeling all of those things, figuring out how to like be okay with anger and outrage as a way to move organizing and mobilization, but also not moving into um, fear and hate, I think is something that, that we'll need to figure out. And previously, you know, it was white straight men who had the monopoly on anger and outrage and rage even, um, and could leverage it in the ways that they, that they wanted to. Um, but I think that's something that we need to navigate in addition to the familism and the culture piece that I talked about earlier. I think those are going to be the, um, 
you know, those are going to be really winning formulas. Um, I, and, and how this outrage, anger versus fear plays out is, um, plays out through disinformation, plays out through, um, you know, plays out through what's happening, you know, and Saru knows this, like I, I spent a lot of time in, in Milwaukee, which is very close to Kenosha. And I was actually going to be in Milwaukee around the time when, when those, when those, those folks were murdered by the white supremacists in Kenosha. And I probably would have been there. Had I been in Milwaukee, I would have been in Kenosha. And like, I think what is our responsibility is to figure out how, so for Presente's half million members, and if I was out there in Kenosha at the time, like how would I speak to our activists and staff and organizers? Because quite frankly, like I've been in very dangerous situations. You know, I was in Ferguson, um, but it was different. Like Ferguson was different. Um, because yes, like I would say a quarter of, of people on who were on, maybe a fifth, let's say a fifth, 20% of people on the streets were probably armed, but it was like, no one was going to fire their weapon because they knew that, um, that the, the, the incredible, the tanks and the national guard and you know, it, every young person I talk to, young person meaning Mike Brown's peers, so 15 to 19 year olds who were armed were like extremely clear and disciplined about like, oh, well, we would never use it. You know, the, the, this is just like, we're armed because that's part of, of the, the life we lead. Um, so it felt like a serious situation, but it didn't feel dangerous in the way that the people I talked to who were in Kenosha at the time just felt like fear. Like there wasn't, there wasn't real protection. And I think like, so navigating these spaces is, is realer. Like what, how do we, how do we tell people to mobilize after the election day at a state house that's like occupied by armed white militia. You know, I couldn't, at this point, I wouldn't tell Presente members to go out in this situation unless, you know, they were super ready to do that. Um, but so I, I guess I say that to say like, I think it's important for us to face the real reality that's going on um, like if I had a staff member now, or if I myself were going out to a protest where I thought we'd be confronted by armed white supremacists, I would actually want to have something in my pocket, a reference guide to how to address a bullet wound. Just try, like, I would want that on like a little chart that says, Hey, you know, here's how you do it. And I would probably bring some like a uh, compression bandage and things like that. So and that's like not something that I I had thought about in other in other protests, quite frankly. Um, and I think that that matters to voting because it matters to civic participation. Like we want people to be engaged for long term, not just from moment to moment, because that doesn't build social movements. And a really good book, if you haven't checked it out, is uh, Twitter and Tear Gas that's written about the, um, you know, it starts around Arab Spring, but it really talks about, you know, just the limitations and the, the culture we have now on like cycling moment to moment to moment to moment and not having the opportunity to really build into transformative change. Um, the story, you know, that, that I like to reference is you know, the original demands of the Montgomery bus boycott. And you may have studied this. You know, the original demands of the Montgomery bus boycott were like less bad segregation, less brutal segregation. Um, it was that, uh, you know, that there could still be segregation, but black folks just wouldn't be forced to move out of the black area if the white area got filled up. 
But it wasn't until organizing happened, like deep community organizing and demand development, that then the demands of the Montgomery Bus boycott became this transformative civil rights experience. Um, but had it just been like outrage, quick demand, quick transactional win, you know, they may have gotten just less brutal segregation and moved on to the next campaign. And that's sort of where, um, where the danger of now, if we just react to things. Yeah, so speaking of that, um, we've spent a lot of time, and Rashad brought it up as well, that uh, whatever social movement erupts after the election can't just be about getting one person out of office. It actually has to be about pushing the next administration to do what we actually need them to do, um, to holding people accountable. So I would just love it, Matt, if you, cause you've done so much of this. Can you just share a few key campaigns where you've actually gone up against people who maybe we consider our friends on the left, Democrats, where you've, you've, you've done really big and successful campaigns on Democrats who really are doing the wrong thing on a particular issue. So the campaign you did on Julian Castro, for example. Um, yeah, just a few examples of how you've organized because I think we're gonna need those kinds of campaigns come January if there's a new administration. Um, for those of us that don't think that Biden on his own will do all the right things. <laughs> um, we're gonna we're gonna need, as Rashad said, to think about this not at not as not as like winning an election, but rather winning the terrain on which we want to fight, basically. Totally. And because I'm a little older than Rashad, I taught him all that stuff. So you know, we're I, I get it. Um, <laughs> the uh, you can tell him I said that. Um, <laughs> the uh, a couple of campaigns that I think are important in this in this regard are um, actually so we had a recent thing, uh, a campaign that we co-led called Dignidad Literaria. And that was a campaign that arose out of this controversy around the book, American Dirt. And so if you've heard about it, like, and when you ask like allies, one of the people who we engaged with was Oprah because Oprah had made American Dirt part of her book club, essentially made, you know, like made the book, made the author a thing when really American Dirt was um, was like largely a fabricated, um, you know, very harmful book for the migrant experience written by, um, you know, uh, a white woman who right before the book came out, I guess, found like a Puerto Rican grandparent and then claimed that she was Latinx. Um, and they had like at their book hearings, they, they had, you know how they have like the nice display with the book on the table and everything, but they, their motif was barbed wire. So they had like this really kind of disturbing barbed wire motif in their thing to exploit the family separation thing to sell books. And, um, you know, it was a campaign and not too many campaigns have gone after that piece of culture, which was literature and and big book publishing, but actually book publishing shapes what you see on TV, what goes into Hollywood. It's a big deal um, culturally. And so we were often in the room with like uh, people who were, you know, Democrat leaning, thought they were progressive, they're in the book industry or they're Oprah or Oprah's people. Um, and it was um, sort of how um, even within Democrats or, you know, people who call themselves progressives, just how intertwined um, racism is with corporate domination capitalism. And so like racial capitalism is a thing and um, it's, you know, been a thing, of course, since the founding of the country, you know, uh, white supremacy has always needed corporate domination and corporate domination has always needed white supremacy. It's actually one of the unique aspects of, of, of U.S. culture, you know, dating back since the founding of the country. 
Um, and so we've been able to campaign on there based on, um, you know, based on taking uh, very clear stances around um, dignity, uh, who controls our stories, um, voice, integrity, culture. And I think that's where you, where you can reach, you know, regardless of what, you know, sort of political party opponent you're going after. I, th I think the same, I think our came with, a campaign with Julian Castro was a wake up call to him. And I actually think he's moved a lot to the left since our campaign and since like our engagement with him, because you can't just um, on the surface, you know, want to be a progressive. You actually have to translate that into the actions you take. And I think you know, that's the difference between uh, transactional organizing, um, transitional organizing, and transformative organizing. Like, we don't, I, I think as long as we settle for give us a little bit, you know, we're always going to be played by both the right as well as, um, you know, Democrats who just want to give us a little bit. Um, and that, I think, speaks to corporate campaigning too because a lot of the corporations especially now they're all black lives matter and they're all like you know rah rah we're activists now um which just isn't true and one of the two interesting things that we've heard directly from opponents one is from the banks and bank policy and this came out in insider stuff is that their policy was um deal with the pest and not with the problem and so their whole strategy is to appease whoever is making the most noise but to not deal with the actual problem that activists are talking about so with the private prison campaign they wanted to just deal with like why were we complaining versus the systemic problem of financing torture for profit um and similarly to uh, when we've heard from ICE offices, when we're dealing with freeing people from deportation, is the ICE procedure is like, under this current administration is, we don't care about the law. We don't care about the policy. Our instructions are to follow the narrative. So they're very keen on tracking media and tracking public sentiment versus like, you know, whatever the laws or policies or procedures that they have to follow. And they're given a lot of discretion in part so that they can read and shape public sentiment that allows them, them to do it. Essentially, they want to win the story in the culture, knowing that that will be powerful enough to win and maintain whatever power uh, they have. And we see that playing out for sure with immigration in that, you know, the Trump regime isn't capable of deporting millions and millions of people like they wanted, like they said they were going to. But what they are capable of is creating these really uh, terror filled stories of raids and repression that's meant to have a, a much wider impact um, on like on the culture. So we have to intervene in that narrative and cultural realm as we uh, push for transformative change. Um, Matt, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. I, my name is Michael Cohen. I'm the SARS co-professor here. I, um, you know, the news dropped this morning from the ACLU that the federal government is now claiming that they there are 545 children who've been taken from their parents whose parents cannot be located. Um, so the, the, the government through their immigration policies effectively orphanized, you know, orphaned, you know, more than more than 500 children um, from their policies at the border. And I'm wondering, you know, I take this kind of horrific, just shocking news. I mean, this is criminal behavior. Um, and yet, um, immigration really does not seem to be a top level issue in the 2020 election in a way that it was in 2016. I mean, if we think back to four years ago, Trump really ran on question of immigration about building the wall and having Mexico pay for it and mass deportations. And 
Uh, I'm wondering, you know, what you think in the past four years has led to the 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 the, the rate at which Im immigration has sort of fallen off the table in the 2020 election. I know it is certainly an issue for in Latinx communities, uh, but it 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 seems, you know, from my sort of point of view it, it perspective, at least, seems not to be a, a major uh, driving issue in this election. I'm just wondering if you can talk about that uh, for us. Yeah, I think the interesting thing about the 2016 election immigration is that it was a top issue for Republicans. Actually, four and five times more of a top issue for Republicans than it was for Democrats. And so immigration was a huge issue in 2016, but being driven by Republicans. And it was like this weird anomaly that all of a sudden Republicans really, really, you know, care about immigration. Um, so from our point of view is like immigration, uh, I think we part of have to define it as it relates to economics, as it relates to human rights, and as it relates to like what type of society we want to live in. But, but so I think the drop off happened because Republicans largely abandoned it in certain way because it, it served their purpose. It's like they were able to use it as a bludgeon against Democrats, knowing that um, Democrats have also been horrendous related to immigration, have been like weak. And it was a lot of people claim it now, but it was actually present the who coined the term deporter in chief to describe the Obama administration. Um, and like caging children happened under Obama, like a lot of this stuff, um, you know, the Obama administration handed over the keys to this vicious apparatus to the Trump administration. And the Trump administration like took the worst parts of it and just made them like they, they went public with the torturous infrastructure that was built in prior administrations. And they did it because that's like they, they wanted to show the carnage and the pain that they can inflict on people to rally the base. Um, so it was very, very strategic, but at the same time, um, Democrats didn't have a, a response because because their policy was terrible. And I think even like like the like sane and somewhat bold responses that like Julian Castro put forth um, in the primary, you know, he was largely ostracized for that because in, and in part because, you know, um, he was sort of bringing up dirt from the Democrats in the Obama administration and because people could say, okay, well, you were in the administration at the time. Why didn't you say anything then? And so I, I think, you know, we're at a point where we actually have to, um, have to, have to be more integrated in our approach to immigration work. I think the biggest thing here that we, we as like an organizing community recently learned is like, we should have been talking about DACA and TPS in the same breath. Like we shouldn't have just been talking about DACA without TPS because by doing so really separated communities. And oftentimes like the parents of DACA recipients are TPS holders. Like there is a direct relationship between um, and among communities. And so I think that um, we're starting to learn those lessons. And also the lessons that the Democrats are going to have to learn is the dramatic failure of comprehensive immigration reform and the, still the deep commitment, the militarization that um, that is bipartisan. And so I think some of those things um, are going to be hard to figure out, but I think is, is in the realm of, of the left to figure out versus the establishment. Um, and I think it'll be a fight like immigration and you know, instilling a, a, a commitment to human rights and, um, 
And dignity is going to be a fight regardless of who gets in in the next administration. I just maybe would want to push on this a little bit in that I totally agree that um, you know Democrats are largely responsible for the failure of the whole thing. <laughs> Um, and, and yeah, set up the systems that then Trump just publicized, but there was a grassroots movement. You know, I remember the marches, you remember the marches with millions of people, sometimes every year. I don't think a, a lot of our students may have been too young for this. This was like 96, early 2000s. There were massive marches with millions of undocumented people coming out. Um, for for years, year after year, and um, and I you just don't see that you, you don't see you definitely don't see immigration as an issue of this election, as Professor Cohen said. Partly because I think you're right, Democrats have no real response, but also you don't see the mass movements that we used to see. Probably because there's so much more fear as to what the Trump administration would do, and not even just the administration, but their militia would do with masses of undocumented people showing up in the streets organizing. And, and I, I do fault in part some of the leadership of those mass movements was selling out with the Democrats for a comprehensive immigration reform, you know, working very hand in hand with big, big business on guest worker bills and these kinds of things that, you know, failed us, just completely, completely failed us. And yet, you, even beyond like the ways in which leadership of those movements did unfortunately work too closely with, the, I think, the wrong side, the mass movements have, have disappeared in some ways. And, and it largely, I think it largely could be the much more, you know, although the Obama administration was cruel with deportation, they were not willing to be public about their cruelty. Whereas the Trump administration and and its minions is willing to be cruel about its uh, about its very public, you know, brutality. And so, would you agree that that might be why we're not seeing, in terms of why it's not an issue of the election? It's not just an issue of Democrats in terms of the electeds. It's also an issue of a lack of mobilization on the part of immigrants yeah. to make it an issue, largely because they are afraid of what could happen to them. Would you, what, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing that we've learned and that I've, and that we as an organization is, has learned through uh, our work with this group called Alianza Americas, um, which we're close to, is that you actually have to have a, a transnational consciousness in immigration. That's one of the things that's been lacking, even in the immigrant rights space, is that it's been way too U.S. dominant. And so we also say you have to have a transnational heart to this, like what's going on in Mexico and Mexican politics, what's going on in Central America matters for U.S. policy. And I actually think that that's something that we really need to grow into. And I really like this, um, like not saying uh, America anymore, but saying America, like like knowing that that we're connected to other regions of America, and that that's really powerful. Um, and so a, a transnational consciousness, a transnational solidarity in organizing, you know, I, I think some of the most powerful work Presente has done with this is that when we connected actively with organizations in, in and along the caravan route, like we we're able to really understand that like part of the problem is that the um, second in command in AMLO's government in Mexico formed an agreement with the Trump administration. You know, part of the problem is, um, you know, the, the military aid that the U.S. leverages on El Salvador and Guatemala in, in Panama. And um, that that all matters in terms of how we shape uh, immigration policy. You know, there's, um, and to make this more real too, is like, I do think asylum and asylum protections are things totally worth fighting for. And, um, and telling those stories can actually, um, can actually really matter. You know, I'm going to bring up, um, you know, I, I, I do want to reference 
Oh, here's the Twitter and tear gas book that I reference. But I also want to reference Roberto's book and one unforgetting. And I think this concept around unforgetting is really important to the to what you're saying, Saru, is like we can't, we have to go through a process of unforgetting, you know, what's happening in Latin America and how, you know, how in many ways US policy created so much violence in other countries. And then also understanding that immigration is a is a climate justice issue. You know, the, the level of climate refugees seeking asylum in the US, I think it's now like almost half of asylum seekers coming to the US are climate related. Um, and uh, one of the, the things that Roberto talks about is just, you know, being there bearing witness. So one of the things he does is he testifies in asylum cases um, and actually is able to get people asylum granted because he can actually tell the real stories about torture and how the U.S. government policy is complicit in that torture of and violation of human rights. Um, you know, in, uh, around the world. And so it does matter. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's been lacking in US politics for a long time is, is there's not, and we can be so connected to groups in other countries, but for some reason we're not. You know, like we're, we're lucky to be so close with Alianza Americas who has staff and office in El Salvador who has connections, that, like I said, all around the, the caravan route, but that's gotta be um, how we organize and who we are as a movement. The one thing I would like to ask briefly, so you, you mentioned a couple of things. This is one of your uh, artwork by one of your members. This is Fabiana Rodriguez that sits in the, I just took it off my wall, it sits in the back. So the, these are a couple of prints of hers. Um, it's sorry, it's hard to sort of see, but like I wanna hype Fabiana all the same because she's, uh, local Oakland hero, um, great community artist. And, and just to get you to speak briefly uh, about the role of, of art, visual, poetic, and otherwise in building social movements. I mean, that's always been a part of, it's part of our founding. You know, we are founded by Fabiana Rodriguez, a visual artist, and uh, Roberto Lovato, a writer. And so you know, becoming a digital organization was always part of that rooted in culture and knowing that like, that actually wasn't a part of a lot of digital organizing prior to groups like Presente and Color of Change. And digital organizing, you know, is 22 years old this year. So it's been around a while, but it, it we always believed that it had to have the culture and the art and the whole, like we have to actually, in order to bring our best selves to the work, our wholeness and our stories have to be respected. And Faviana, you know, got her start in art by making poster art. So her history comes from a legacy of activists, poster artists, and Favi would put together her art, make a bunch of posters and like, bring them to protests and, you know, and, and the, the white folks would gasp that you know, her images were so powerful and unapologetically, you know, brown and, and down and, and pro-woman and pro-migrant. Um, but that's how she got her start in the, in the power of art and politics. Um, and actually that's a brilliant story. Like you can, I think there's there like at one of the um, art museums in Oakland, they have like a history of of her poster art as well as how she connected to other famous protest artists like Emery Douglas of the Black Panther Party. Um, Ricardo Levin's Morales is also a, a fairly well known protest poster artist. But that that was um, you know I think that that has to maintain a thing and, and hopefully we don't lose that with the emphasis on social media but that we actually broaden and expand the connection of art and culture to everything we do because we are made of culture you know we are made of stories 
And, um, you know, I actually think one of the things that we're going to try to dig in as we help produce more books is like, you know, storytelling can be in everything we do and actually should be in everything. And like a skill around human, you know, sharing stories of humans is something that unfortunately is often lacking in, in the in the organizing work because I think that's changing, but there was always the the emphasis on just being right. Like if we're right, we're gonna win. But it's it's not about being right. It's about people caring and bringing. And Fabiana talks about this all the time. Like you can't just reach the rational part of your brain. We have to reach the emotional part of the brain as well in order for people to take deeper, meaningful action. And that's what art and culture does. And that's why it's powerful. Terrific, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great answer. I, um, let me turn to the students here. Um, uh, Emerson, go ahead and uh, ask your question, please. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Um, super interesting. Um, so I'm really interested in kind of looking at Biden's inability to connect with various groups of voters, um, given that he's a 77 year old white male and therefore has kind of trouble connecting with um, younger voters as well as black and Latinx voters. So I'm curious to know where the Latinx community sort of lies within this conflict. Like, are they more likely to sort of settle for Biden or default to Trump or do they fully support Biden and not really feel that like disconnect? Yeah, I think it's really too early to tell. Um, I'll drop a link on the, the most current research here um, that addresses your question. And um, yeah, so I think that that like it's, like I mentioned that that's always gonna be contested. And I think though, there is like a strategy piece here that maybe, um, that maybe is where we should always go because it, it's not that Biden needs all the Latino votes. He just needs like enough Latinx votes from enough key states in order to win. And so I think that there is this like game theory around elections that's really important as it relates to like, does he need just a critical mass um, versus like the other side of it is how do we actually build and leverage the power in our communities? So I think Biden is, is made a recent investment into Latinx communities and hiring, but it was very late. It's actually very similar to how Clinton invested last minute into black communities, but only in the last two weeks of the election. And it has nominal results, but I think from their perspective, they're just trying to get the nominal results so that they don't lose key states. And it and I, you know, I know that people think about Arizona and Texas a lot that's been brought up. But the last election you know, many people say came down to about 20,000 votes in Wisconsin. And, you know, Wisconsin in the, in the, the, the city of Milwaukee has, um, what, like 80,000 Latinos in the city of Milwaukee. So even in, in key states with not, that aren't known for their Latinx communities, just reaching more percentage of those folks can swing those. Amy Allison also just talks about how like, if three, I, she may have said this at her talk, but if about 3% more women of color turn out, it would totally change the election results and the electoral college. And so um, I think it's knowing that, and I actually think part of our job is to be part of that game theory so that we can say like, look, you know, like, like these are the communities that we need in order to win and that we should be treated with the respect and resource that is um, usually reserved to like suburban white soccer moms and 
what was that guy plumber in the last election plumber joe or joe the plumber from joe Ohio. the plumber yeah that was 2012 yeah <laughs> wasn't it or was it 2008 the years have blended together at this point. I mean, and then there was the red sweater guy. Yes, all of these weird characters that show up in our elections. Um, but but it, that. let me. But there is a. Go just ahead. put a quick finer point on it. But there is a dramatic lack of investment in black voters, in young voters, and Latinx voters, like dramatic. And you know, these election cycles are billions and billions of dollars are spent, and like they're not spent on building the power of our communities. And that has to change. So let me ask you something based on a couple of things that have been put into the chat, which is just that, um, you know, so so Bernie Sanders won the Nevada primary. Uh, he won the California primary, which is significant. A, a socialist won the, the Democratic primary of the largest state in the union. Um, what did Bernie do in terms of organizing Latino communities that we're, either are or are not seeing on the Democratic side right now? Um, Bernie hired Latinx leaders. You know, Bernie hired people from social movements. And I actually think that was a big difference even between Bernie and Warren's campaign, is that Bernie hired from social movements, talked to social movements. I think his mistake is that he actually didn't build those relationships with black social movements until very, very late. Um, and, but he built those relationships with younger Latinx social movements very early um, and would invite people in to write his policy and inform him. And it was a huge oversight that he didn't do that with younger black folks because the interesting thing about, about Bernie as someone who you know I've sat down with a few times is that at the end of the day, he actually is someone who is more of a facilitator. Like he's a great facilitator of people. He, and he had some of the right people in the room and he was very open to that. Like he, he didn't need to be the guy talking all the time. Like he actually did want to learn from people like Erica Andiola, who was a, you know, who's a presentista, former presentista staff, who now runs advocacy at Raices, who was a, a high level in the Bernie campaign, really shaped the immigration policy. I think that's what he did right, but he failed in terms of that with uh, uh, younger Black organizers and movement builders. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, okay, so let me, uh, let's turn to Samantha, please. Uh, hello, thank you so much for coming in today. I actually had two questions. Uh, the first of which is in regards to Prop 25 uh, on the California ballot. Given that you have worked in uh, helping dismantle or in the effort to dismantle private prison industry, uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about what it would look like if Prop 25 were to pass with particular focus on the possible implementation of an algorithmic approach to who does and does not get freedom. And secondly, uh, religion has played a, a very big role in this election. And I'm curious to hear what you think is the significance of the Catholic church with regards to various Latinx communities and how that may affect the vote. Yes, 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 yes. I, I do think that, um, so, Cash bail is, is one aspect of what I would call privatized incarceration. And, um, you know, there is an active debate on like, why focus on privatized incarceration when like the state apparatus is so messed up as well. Um, you know, our view in, in privatized incarceration, private prison has a particular outsized impact on migrant detention so that's part of why we focus on it, because I think like upwards of more than 60, almost 70% of immigrants detained are detained in privately run facilities. And the other aspect that relates to the proposition in my mind, and I haven't studied the proposition closely at all, is that allowing private prisons to expand also allows this entire industry to expand. And I think cash bail is part of the privatized industry. 
the all the price gouging related to phone calls, e-carceration is part of the um, huge industry around like charging people fees for their ankle bracelets and interest and like this whole cycle of um, using people who are victims of the criminal justice system as like ATM machine, you know? And that, so that's like part of it in private prisons and the torture that happens in them and the like non COVID protections and the particular like locking people up to make a profit, the like direct relationship that has to slavery. So, you know, privatized incarceration, I think, has a lot of, of um, you know, when you dig deep into the industry, there's a lot of horrible outgrowths of that and a lot of relationships. And I think cash bail is a big one. And I think e-carceration is a big one. Um, and so I, I think any, any, but when you move from a private system to giving more power back to the state, it actually has to come with more community control. You know, and I think like that the whole debate around defunding police is an interesting one because what we're seeing now, and I, you know, I have family in Minneapolis and grew up there is like, as police departments are being defunded, and now with the recent reports of unfortunately murder rates going up in a lot of cities, rich communities, rich white communities are gonna to move toward privatized police departments and privatized law enforcement. And whereas like if the goal was greater community control and greater, you know, in the context of police brutality, greater black community control over police budgets and, and departments, then it's more of a matter of like, if social movements were in control of police, we would probably defund and defer, di divert that money. Um, but if it's just about um, shifting, you know, the, the infrastructure without shifting who has power, we're gonna run into a lot of unforeseen problems. And in, in the case of defunding police, we're gonna run into a lot of privatization crises of um, private police forces. Um, and then the, the second question was about, oh, religion. Um, that's like really interesting because one of the um, fastest growing evangelical segment as well as fastest growing um, Muslim communities are from Latinx. So like Latinx people are, are definitely like a Catholic stronghold, but are also rising in the ranks of both um, for Muslim folks as well as evangelical. So it, it, this religious piece is going to be a contested ground at the same time related to reproductive rights and politics, Latinx communities are much less likely to say their religious leader should control their political decisions or influence them, less likely than, than um, religious-based Black voters. So the more Black voters will say, oh yeah, my whoever religious leader should and can influence how I vote at higher levels than Latinx people do so it is there's like a, a separation and there's a lot of 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 latinx folks who will say oh yeah my religion doesn't necessarily support abortion and at the same time i would be the first person to help a family member out if they needed to have an abortion so that so there's all these paradoxes with latinx communities especially as it relates to to religion Hi, um, I just have a question. We, you, um, you were talking earlier about um, how basically like this culture of fear has been created by the Trump administration that has um, sort of kept the the voice of like Latinx communities, especially on the issue of immigration, sort of kept them down. And it sort of meant that like it's not really being discussed in this election cycle. So do you think that this culture of fear could um, 
impact the ability for change to be made even once like the Trump administration is gone and more receptive leaders are are in power? Do you think that um, there could this, there could be a lasting effect that um, reduces the the voice of Latinx community and um, reduces the willingness of of leaders within that within that community to um, take the risk of speaking out or something along those lines? Um, I think that there that folks are going to be much more clearer in the demands if it's a Biden administration. And I think people will be much more clear about the threat if it's a Trump second term. And so I think that we just know a lot more about, and we also know a lot more about how the Trump administration has used fear as a universalizing force for his base. Um, and so I think that like we're much more savvy to that. Um, and even differentiating between like taking Trump literally and taking Trump seriously, I think a lot more of us are, are hip to that game. Like we just know that yes, we have to take him seriously, but also know that he's fighting a fear and culture war. And that to combat that we have to, to do it head on. Like there actually has to be a, a commitment of mutual aid and people showing up for each other and solidarity. And, and I think there's much more of an awareness that we have to go on that realm because that's where he's drawing power from. And if it's a new administration, I think the expectations will be extremely high and, um, and people will assert those, those really bold and transformative demands. Um, but fear, you know, the interesting thing about using fear is like, it's always been a powerful tool, but I think now that it's been so public and so brazen how they've used it, it's lost some of its power. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really going back to something that I think people should study about this. And I was going to bring it up before is like in New York city, you know, like before people were like the, Moms for Housing in Oakland taking over a vacant home. Um, this was happening in New York City um, uh, in the late 90s. And it was happening by undocumented and unafraid immigrants who were um, taking over property in New York City. And guess who they were? They were Zapatistas. So the EZLN, offshoots of the EZLN were involved in very active um, housing is a human right battles in New York. And they would say, they would dare, they would dare city officials to say, fine, yeah, you know, target us. Say, you know, if you want to make a story about Zapatista, Zapatistas organizing in New York City, go ahead. You know, and, and largely the New York authority at the time left them alone because they knew that they could win the narrative and the culture um, standing up for housing rights, even though they were undocumented. And so that's one like transnational consciousness that I think um, is very different than how we see a lot of uh, the organizing paradigm happen. Yeah, I just wanna add to what Matt started out this class saying, you know, he started out by saying Thank you to you all, to your generation for everything that you do and pushing the envelope. Um, because to me, so much of the changes that Matt's talking about, even though immigration is not a major issue of this election, the fact that the way that we talk about immigration is so different now than it was when I was in my 20s, um, you know, for so long the seniors in the immigration movement said they, the language was, uh, we are hard workers. We are not criminals. We are not terrorists. We just want to work. We're hard workers. And it was an acceptance of this racial hierarchy that America has created that the immigrant, some of the immigration leaders kind of bought into that, 
you know, we're not the black people, we're not the Arabs, we're the good hardworking, we just want to work and we'll work all day and we'll do whatever. And that led to these really bad uh, partnerships with industry. You know, there was a moment where there was a huge coalition with the National Restaurant Association and the Chamber of Commerce and the major immigrant rights groups all together saying, we need immigration reform. It's okay, it can include guest worker provisions. Um, you know, it can, in some cases, and it can, it can even include E-Verify, but we need immigrants to be able to stay. Under what conditions, with what rights, we're not talking about, but we just need them to be able to stay in the country. And even after that, some of the language of the dreamers and the DACA, again, you know, distinguishing us from the other folks, you know, it's, we're just young people trying to get an education as opposed to what? As opposed to other immigrants who are trying to be here, who, are, who don't have as much of a right as people who just want. And so I just feel like the, maybe it's not a horrible thing that immigration is not the major issue of this election because maybe we needed to take a step back and come back with a much more progressive frame that is not just about people being able to stay in the country, but as Matt just talked about with the Zapatistas, stay in the country with rights, with dignity, um, you know, and alongside everybody else so that we will not, we, nobody's a criminal, nobody's a terrorist among communities of color. We all deserve to be here and we all deserve to be respected. So I, I, I just think maybe it's okay for us to be taking a step back because hopefully in the, if there's a new administration, in the new administration, we come back as communities of color not any one committee pit, community pit against each other, but we come back as communities of color demanding collective liberation, not just immigration reform. And the pandemic is gonna be integrating these issues a lot more, you know, as we recover from the pandemic and the economic crisis, like migrants and Latinx communities, you know, and, and overall the devastation this will, will force us to be more um, intersectional in how we talk about things um, and will force us to make bolder demands, I think. Yeah, of course, we are not recovering from the coronavirus pandemic. We are well on a steeply upward third wave curve. So um, let's, let's, uh, we'll see what happens. You know, we're going to have to figure this out in the midst of a pandemic. I, I, there's no waiting for recovery. There's no recovery coming at this point. Um, let's uh, let's turn to to Riley, who uh, may I think may uh, forward us our, our last question. Awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Nelson, thank you so much for being here. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, if it's all right, I'll just read my question and put it into the chat. Um, so, in another one of my classes, we read uh, an article that claimed that most Americans don't have what they call the coherent political ideology, um, which, in the words of the article, meant um, the the voting choices of Americans are not arbitrary, but they're not actually based in like policy or policy goals of candidates. Um, and in turn, this leads campaign organizers to model campaigns more around image rather than like substance. Um, so, I was just wondering, like, I would love to hear your thoughts on this, and if that has been the case with communities you work with, or if you haven't found this to be true. Yeah, um, I, I interpret this as part of like, there's not really um, undecided voters anymore. The undecided voters are people who are going to decide whether or not to vote, not like who they're going to vote for. And there's also not like this um, undecided on the fence voter, it's persuadables. And it's, it's people who just need to be... Um, you know, need to, to relate one way or another. And, and honestly, I think the way to get at ideology and like we talked about culture and caring and empathy is through values. So I actually think that leading with values is where we need to go. And I do see a lot of the like um, image-based or going back to the same old like TV ads or celebrity influencers, which that stuff often just doesn't work um, or has really minimal impact. But I think that there are some core values, especially now that we're facing multiple levels of crisis. And some of the values are like 
you know, change happens when we lead and when we act together. You know, we need each other. Um, you know, through the the pandemic and the um, racism, you know, like having a value around, we'll take care of each other because that's what we do. Even a value around activists and organizers, like that's what activists do. Like we look out for each other because that's what activists do. You know, um, this, you know, this incredible organizer, activist, um, who Saru, Saru knows, Zach, you know, we keep us safe. He you know, came to me a, too, man. <laughs> and uh, he added himself and his relationship to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a... He knows him. Th that's a value, is like a value of like protecting each other and community. And I think if we try to always lead and connect with people and, and our values, that can get us toward... You know, quite frankly, I think that gets us toward a more coherent political ideology because, you, you know, it's like what we care about and hold dear, especially now that so much of what we care about and hold dear are either separate from us physically or are in danger. Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's very good. I would, you know, this would be you know, I, I haven't read the article that uh, that Riley's talking about, but I, I would certainly insist on the first hand, there is no such thing as a coherent political ideology. Ideology is an imaginary relationship to the real world, right? There's no such thing as a coherent political ideology. All political ideologies are incoherent to one degree or another in that they are not exact scientific mappings of the social world. They are, as I said, an imaginary relationship to real contradictions in the world. Um, religion is an ideology, science is an ideology, storytelling is an ideology. One cannot actually understand a world that is vastly overcomplicated uh, and global in its perspective in anything other than an imaginary relationship. So I don't know what, you know, what a coherent political, in the sense, I'm a Democrat, I believe everything they believe, or I'm a Republican, I believe everything they believe. And so this question of substance versus image breaks down very quickly. The idea that like, what, what, is, what is substantive that you have? you've read all the policy papers most of the people who vote in congress haven't read all of the policy papers they don't they they have an imaginary relationship to the legislation they're passing so i think these kinds of dichotomies of of real or incoherent political ideologies or image versus substance is not a helpful way of actually thinking about how politics actually works image is substance i mean think about that obama hope poster it's pretty superficial, right? But there was a tremendous amount of substance that was actually communicated and expressed in these ways. Think about the ways in which Trump projects himself with the American flag and standing above a crowd and, and the kind of hyper-masculinism of his imagery. That is his substance, that is substantial. So I think there's, there's, and then to think about the roles in which identity actually plays in politics also kind of, which is to say that like, what, to vote with your identity or in a sense that your identity is being recognized that that somehow is less than substantial these are i don't know that these are helpful categories for analyzing um what actually goes on politically i mean like matt i mean you've you've talked about the the question of you know uh, identity and like how that actually plays into latinx voting but like the complexity of latinx identities do create all kinds of contradictory um, political conclusions within that broader community. Right. And I do think where it's important is like perception is powerful. And especially now, like kind of pun intended, perception trumps truth often. And um, also winning the narrative is super important. Like it's not enough to just win the policy if you can win the narrative as well, then that has such a catapulting effect. And the right knows this very well, even when they lose. Like, even when they like lost on Obamacare, they actually won substantial parts of the narrative. And so I think that's like um, also part of the political strategy um, that's important. But, go but going back a little more rooted is um, the relationships is the uh, the relationship is based on shared values and goals that I think are are fundamental to every organizing project. 
Well, I thank you so much, Matt, for making time. We really appreciate it. I guess um, in closing, would you say a little bit more about what you and Presente are planning for kind of the post-election civil war? I'm not sure what to call it. <laughs> what are you all gearing up for as an organization to do right after the election? And how are you seeing it? You know, some people are talking about we've got to see it in phases. It's like leading up to the election, election to uh, the state votes being counted and then state votes to inauguration and that we've got to phase our direct action. How are you all thinking about it? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll leave you with a, um, with like a, uh, not before public crazy idea that may or may not go anywhere because I do believe that part of how we win is through creativity and through forums like this where we talk through incredible potential ideas. So my idea is that I actually think we should set up concession stands in all the contested states and at the Capitol and that we give information and that we like, assuming that the president won't concede if he loses, that we set up concession stands all over the place to force him to concede. Um, and I don't know how you deal with food like cotton candy and you know, popcorn and hot dogs and funnel cakes and peanuts in your concession stand um, based on COVID. So we'd have to find a COVID safe way to give out food and have people snacking. And you'd have like famous concession stand professionals who have very loud voices and who are very respected in the community. Like, like the, the peanut guy from the famous peanut guy from Dodger Stadium or whatever. But that's the idea is uh, concession stands. So I encourage creative movement, revolutionary thinking. And I think that's what's going to get us through in all of this like real difficult, painful time that people are enduring. So that's also what I want to leave people on is like, let's find ways to do what we can to, to support each other because everybody's going through it. And, uh, and that just means that we need to, to find that, that love and care, care and compassion and understanding um, and to be, yeah, and to like do that better because we can always use that. So thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you, Matt. It. Thank you for making time for us. So much time. Really appreciate it. Let's everybody give Matt a thank you um, and we'll see you all next week. Mm -hmm.